It says we're live. Are we live? Well, we're alive, at least. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon uh, or good evening, wherever you are. And if you're watching this in some time in the future, then this will be the past. And thanks for watching. Uh, I'm Daniel. This is Gabor. And look, we're in the same room. Actually, in the same room. On the, a... on the same couch, no less. Yeah, in the house where you grew up. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Grew up. We moved in here in 84. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm visiting Vancouver partly because I haven't been here in ages, but also it was time for us to really get down to Write, writing this book, writing this book. And we've been having mostly daily meetings and planning and it's good. It's feeling nice. Um, so the book is hello again, a fresh start for parents and their adult children. Um, this is, uh, Daniel's and I second book together. This one though is not going to be. Gabor with Daniel will be Gabor and Daniel, or perhaps Daniel and Gabor. If we did alphabetically. If we did alphabetically, or if we did it even in the order of who took the initiative on this, actually. Um, in any case, it's based on a workshop that we've done a few times, some of which you can see on YouTube. And we're doing these YouTubes live in order to introduce our process, to gather more information, to get your questions, and really to gain more material for our book. So in watching this and in sending your questions um, and perhaps volunteering to be interviewed by us, you're actually helping us prepare this new book of ours, which we expect to be finished writing by the end of next May. Well, that's our first draft. Let's not overpromise. Yeah, okay, our first draft. Yeah, but we're currently, we're thinking maybe late 2025 as a pub date. Pub date, yeah. Yeah, but we'll see. Don't hold us to that. Um, yeah, and... Uh, and unlike, I'd say, the last book, The Myth of Normal, this is the kind of book that, as we're writing it, we have to be actively wondering about the subject ourselves. And, and, and we're, we're, it's, it's not like, like with The Myth of Normal and living it, right? Because mm -hmm. it's about us and you and everybody. It's, as far as I can tell, a pretty universally relevant topic. But it's one that we have <clears> not <throat> mastered. And not only have we not mastered it in terms of doing it perfectly, and the good news is there's no such thing as doing it perfectly, but I don't think we've explored it fully either. There's a lot of, it's a, tri it's a very, um, I mean, we've done a lot of work on it. And I think we understand a lot about it more than we did, but the more we do it, the more we understand. So this is an active process you're watching here. You're not watching two experts this is just well, these, are, watching, these are dispatches yeah. from the front. We could you're, say you're watching one expert and his son. Let me put it that way. <laughs> yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I want to say something. Well, so first of all, what's it like having your uh, favorite child in the house? It's been lovely. Yeah. Um, and I'm just so glad that we're finally done to this process of being face to face and writing the book we've been talking about it and um it began to feel a bit abstract that's right especially with all the hubbub around the myth of normal the other book we wrote together so it's really good to have you here personally yeah first of all uh, it does feel different than other times it does yeah and and then it's just also very good to be um practically grasping the subject and working with it yeah I'm glad it feels good for you. It feels good for me too. I've been very nervous about this book. Mm. And I, I wonder, I think some of that nervousness might have come across in the last live stream we did. Mm. Most of the YouTube comments were highly positive, but as always happens when we get on screen or on stage together to talk about this, people have reactions. Yeah. People have opinions. People see things probably that we don't see. Yeah. Um, and they're very sensitive to the little subtle, um, moments of friction in our body language, yeah. in the way we speak. It often happens that in, in certain crowds, many people come to this as a fan of yours, mm -hmm. previous to knowing I exist. And so some people, um, and on the last YouTube live, this is just definitely the case. And I, <laughs> I had to, keep, as we were doing it, the comments were coming up my screen and I just had to filter it out. Um, uh, but some people were noticing that I was interrupting you mm. or that I seemed um, what they perceived as hostile or one person commented on my sarcasm and noted that sarcasm is a sign of a lack of healing. Was there any, did you 
Was there anything in those comments that you recognize as perhaps true? Oh, or? there's more than a grain of truth in 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 yeah. everything. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> I should say, uh, you know, on a, on some of our YouTube videos from our talks, other people point out things they notice about you that surprise yeah. them. You know, yeah. in terms of your body language being closed to me or a certain kind of whatever. I, I don't need to repeat it. Well, what's interesting about YouTube comments, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, quite apart from what they notice about interaction, say people are watching one of my talks on YouTube and the comments range from everything. Like he's like Jesus walking on the water to this guy is sick, you know? And um, <clears throat> I think you're more like Jesus kind of floating face down in the water. <laughs> So, or, or or just kind of pl splashing in the water, let's yeah. say that. All right, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> in any case... Um, it ranges from that. It, 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 it ranges a wide range of comments. And um, But what I find interesting is that sometimes in the most hostile comments, there's actually a grain of truth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like so, I just said. So... <clears throat> It may be distorted and exaggerated and, and, and refracted through that person's particular, to some degree, troubled consciousness, but they're picking it up on something, you sure. know? You know? Um, and so, well, so, so, so sometimes those negative comments are quite instructive if I choose to look at them without defensiveness. Completely. You know? No, and I, I always know that there's something in there. Um, for me, so last, I just wanted to address that about last time because it's an interesting contrast to now, and I wouldn't be saying it if it was just about us. But I think there's probably, hopefully, something um, worth wondering about for everybody. Um, what happened last time, in my experience, it, I thought it was a very good conversation, and most people did too. Mm. And you know, but I did leave at the end of it. I did have to kind of sort of exhale at the end of it. There was a tension in me. Mm. And it was, I think, multiple things were going on, as I think always happens in these relationships. It's never just about, we can get so plugged into the relationship itself, and we focus on the content of the relationship, and we forget that there's two individuals coming at it from their own lives. Here I am over in Brooklyn, you're here. And at the time, I was dealing with some anxieties in my life. Yeah some of them having to do with this book in particular, because as you said, it had gotten a little bit abstract yeah. and you had been traveling a lot and I had done some writing and we hadn't had a chance to really talk about it. Yeah. So I had tension. I was coming into it with some tension. I saw myself as sort of the host or the, the like, you know, it was on my, I was managing the stream. So I was feeling kind of responsible for that. Yeah. Um, and, and then, so it's partly what's going on in my life having nothing to do with you. And then there's stuff happening between us. And then there were things happening about the book that I hadn't articulated for myself yet. Ideas I had, but yeah. I hadn't said them yet. So anyway, it's just that all kinds of, when you, when you look at any scene between a parent and an adult child, if you were a fly on the wall, you'd have to have 10 flies on the wall to get a full picture because there's so many different ways of looking at what's happening. I'm well, not sure what was happening for you that day. Well, there's another dimension here, which I just got in touch with actually as I was listening to you. Not only are you and I in conversation, you and I in conversation with an audience mm -hmm. um, watching us, you know, however many there are or will be. And <clears throat> this is not just been adults and parent children. <clears throat> it's um, adults and it's about parents and children in general being in a supermarket with a three-year-old, <laughs> you're not only conscious of your interaction with the child and your need to get things done while the child may have another agenda, you're also conscious of what do people think who are watching you, you know? So that we're living our lives in several dimensions. Right. You know? And um, sometimes I notice myself wanting to control things or to censor things, um, not because I can't handle it on the personal level, but because I'm worried about how it might look on the public level. Well, I want, I, but I you know, so, so I'm, just, I'm, I'm just talking about that. I'm just owning that other dimension. Yeah, there, yeah. You know, I appreciate which, that. Which, which gets in the way of the actual um, genuine interaction between two people. Yeah, and, and and of of the comments that have historically talked about things people notice about you on stage with me, that's mm. what they notice. Yeah, that you're trying to control 
or curtail my the way I express myself that you're uncomfortable with it. Yeah. And that might date back all the way through our relationship, and I think it does yeah. to my childhood. It also has to do with the fact that you have a pub, more of a public following than me, so you might mm. be conscious of that. But that, again, that does speak to the multidimensionality of it, and that's something that then I could say you haven't grown out of, of thinking that I'm a three-year-old and we're in a supermarket and you have to worry about how I would, you know, how, yeah. how the effect I'm having on people. And how we would be perceived. Well... And I, I'm sure I do the same thing. But but to generalize this, yeah, um, I think that in all parent-child relationship, an adult-child parent relationship, there's an idea of how it should be. Yes, that's right. And um, the parent may have a particular idea of how it should be, and so by the child. And so not only are people relating to each other on a one-to-one -one level, there's also this secondary level where they're almost looking down at themselves yeah. or not not looking down in the sense of negatively but yeah from the outside they're, they're looking at themselves on the outside and how will this look to others and how does this compare to the way it should be right so that so that rather than be concerned about how it is it's just it's also like there's an ideal there and and people are not comfortable and but, over here the experience i mean if i could sum up some of the most painful stuff from my childhood. It was yeah. you trying to manage me. Yeah. I mean, in the quintessential story that you've told many times, and now I've told you, you're not allowed to tell anymore publicly yeah. about the time you hit me. Yeah. Got angry at me because I wouldn't sing happy birthday to you in front of the family. And this was last week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Actually. So, so, so in those moments, what people observe yeah. And and it's funny because it takes people observing it from the outside for me to see it mm. is that my pain at your embarrassment about me or your reaction to me comes up and all of my, <coughs> the ways that I've always coped, which is what? Being, yeah. try to be more clever than you. Yeah. Trying to get the no, word in before not, you do. Well, that's not too difficult. Come on. Well, I'm not saying it's difficult, but, <laughs> but why is it not difficult? Because I, the, 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 the blade of my wit was sharpened on the whetstone of my, of my effort to try and overcome something in our relationship, right? No, that's a good line. We should keep that for the book. Absolutely. The blade of my wit sharpened on the whetstone of your what? It's very, uh, well, of, of, of the ways I had to overcome and compensate and, yeah. and uh, yeah. or of your, your adamantine uh, granite personality, let's say. <laughs> adamantine. I like that. That's a good word. Yeah. Yeah. I learned it from, uh, from the movie network. Anyway. Um, the point being, when you're observing dynamics between a parent and a child, you're observing holdovers from history. You're observing things that haven't, haven't stopped happening. And it's kind of weird to watch a grown-up man in his 40s react to his father as if I'm still a three-year-old. And meanwhile, there's something maybe more subtle going on in the other direction. You know, so... And, of course, none of that has to do with actually... It's very little of that, I would say has to do with what's going on between us in the present, which is why sure. we say in the workshop that only 20% of the work really is between the two of you. 80% of the relationship is between you and the relationship, not between each other. It's happening inside of you. It's not happening, sure. you know, and we each have our relationship to this relationship. You have this imagined version of me that you yeah. project onto me. And I have the same thing about you. And a lot of it has to do with memory and a lot of it has to do with other things. Which brings me... Um, before we take questions, uh, to a couple of movies you and I have watched. Yeah, I, I uh, thought it would be. I thought yeah. it would be a nice thing while we're working on this thing to 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 view some, because, especially since we can tend to get into our thing and think it's about us, and clearly it's not. This is a universal. We've been talking about the mythic dimensions of it. Yeah. It goes all the way back to the Bible, to the Bible, and, and then the Greek tragedians, and and and. And, and Shakespeare and all over the place. Mean, King Lear is a story about a yeah. parent and his adult children, right? And the ways he can't see them. Absolutely. And he idealizes one and or two of them. And he, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so there's a couple of documentaries we've watched over the past few days that have, they're, they're, they're very, they've been very personally relevant for me. And I, we've really enjoyed watching them. So one of them was uh, a documentary by my lookalike. I'm sure he gets told he looks like me all the time. Yeah. Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> I've been being 
RDJ was my stage name at Hip Hop Karaoke, and I've been told that I look like him constantly since I was about 15. There's quite a resemblance, and as you get older, both of you, there's, the resemblance is, just gets even more uncanny. And as people have said to me for a long time, it's not just a physical resemblance. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. something about my, and I can see it, my the way my face is animated. My I'm always, when I'm, he's very good with words and always crafting yeah. bond modes, you know, like, yeah. um, He's always being clever and a little bit outside of things. And I can I recommend I, I recognize that ironic tendency. And in this the documentary, which is about his father, I got to see partly where that came from. Mm. So it's a documentary called Senior. It's on Netflix, recommended to everybody. Wonderful film. Really, really wonderful film. And it's about his father, who you might not know, or might not know as well, whose name is Robert Downey Sr., who passed away really during the making of the film, not to give away the ending. Um, but it's a film he made as an attempt to understand his father and his relationship with his father. And his father was an experimental filmmaker, a very significant one, an underground New York filmmaker who never got very famous because he didn't make very many movies in Hollywood. And when he did, it was kind of a disaster because he wasn't made to make studio films. He was made to make his Irre very irreverent, extremely irreverent. Probably his most famous movie was called Putney Swope, which was very avant-garde for the time or even for now but anyway it's this attempt of a very famous son who at one point maybe still is the highest paid movie actor in the world mm. we're going to see him in oppenheimer today he's in that movie oh is he now yeah okay. um he plays the general or... i'm not sure yeah but, okay. um, right. of course he got most famous no, for playing no, it's mad damon that plays general. okay yeah so okay. he played tony stark uh iron man and of course he has a very notorious history of of and a very public history of, of drug addiction and self-destructive behavior in the 90s. So this movie is him interviewing his father. His father also insists on making his own edit of the movie within the movie because his father's always thinking in terms of films. His father is completely lost in his work, in his art. Yeah. He's a workaholic, clearly. Yeah. He do, you know. But just what was your impression of the film? What did you get from watching it? Well, or what stood out to you? In the beginning, it was almost like two characters a bit outside the frame, a bit outside their own lives, just trying to come to terms with, or to frame their story somehow. And, and as the movie progressed, there was less and less distance between the story and the characters. Mm -hmm. And it became not just very clever, and witty observers of their life history, but as participants in it, as it unfolded, mm -hmm. as the father gets increasingly feeble, yeah, um, Parkinson's. Parkinson's disease as he um, nears his demise, um, and um, and they get very honest, you know, so that the father had a long period of, of drug addiction, living a life in a haze, and at some point, the junior says, Robert Downey Jr. says, you know, well, shall we talk about the impact of those years on my life? He kind of gingerly says, I, I would be remiss, you know, if, if I didn't, if we didn't wonder about the impact that had on me. And you remember what the father says? Father says, I mean, I want to be there for that conversation. He says, boy, I would give a lot to miss that conversation. I yeah, tell you. yeah. But, they, but he is there for it. He is. Yeah. He, they don't, he, he doesn't get, at least on camera, very emotionally vulnerable, but you can see he lets he lets it show his feelings do come through. Who's that? the yeah. father? Yeah, the father. And I yeah. think I sense throughout it, it's very warm and lovely. I did sense that Robert Downey Jr. was seeking something from his father that had been missing for a long time, mm. which was an ability to really be seen yeah. for who he is. Mm -hmm. Robert Downey Jr. grew up on camera. Talk about people yeah. watching you, you know? Yeah. He grew up around movie sets with movies being filmed in his living room while he's sleeping in the next room with drugs and alcohol going on and a lot of creativity. His first uh, spoken lines as, a, as an actor were, is there hair on your balls? Yeah, do you have any hair on your balls? Yeah. Which yeah. you have to watch it to get the context. Yeah. But he was um, six or seven when his father gave him that line to say, and it's cute and funny, but he also imagined what was that childhood like? Yeah very confusing, lots of excitement, and clearly his parents loved him, Yeah. but no wonder he became such a little performer. 
Lots of stimulation. Lots of constant stimulation yeah. and probably a lot of anxiety that couldn't be, you know, seen. And someone just commented that it's great to watch. Uh, it's, I appreciate seeing Gabor truly listening to Daniel and allowing him to fully express himself. I bet that took practice. Um, well, that's a first, folks. Right, right here on camera, Gabor listens to Daniel. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it happens sometimes. It really does. Um, and it's probably happened... But the thing is, it was intermittent when I was a kid. But what I noticed about Robert Downey Jr. was I, I sensed a longing for that, yeah. but also his own ironic way yeah. of deflecting his own feelings and yeah. making light of things yeah. meant that he couldn't just say, Dad, I'm hurting, or Dad, I, you I know, was hurting. I was hurting, and Dad, I really want to know you before you die. But as yeah. the movie goes on and the father's defenses start breaking down, he gets yeah. more transparent, less yeah. opaque. Yeah. So it was really... Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful portrait. And what I was struck by is, um, is was Junior's gentleness towards his father. Yeah. You know, he may have been hurting inside him. Oh, well, first of all, he's done a lot of work himself. He got into yoga when he, you know, he, I mean, he nearly died of many times. He woke up uh, after blacking out in the neighbor's living room once. You know, mm. and he was arrested and in jail a lot, and mm. so he's turned his life around. I'm sure, and he's got a he's, and he's got a family. He's got a family, you know, and you know, and I actually think this is an important point. Is when it comes to what we call about forgiveness um, from the child to the parent, um, we may think it has to do just with what happened in childhood. And the way parents may have hurt their kids, and then the resentment or the anger or the pain that adult children hold on to that. But actually, I think it also has to do with what's happening in that adult child's life. Well, I, sure. I, I, let me finish this. I story. am letting you finish. I'm yeah. just agreeing. Okay. So that the more the child, him, her, themselves, create a life for themselves that they're satisfied with, the less they find there is to forgive. And the more perhaps they can identify the actual love that was also there all along, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting dance that doesn't just have to do with the facts of what happened, but it has a lot to do with what's actually happening right now. Absolutely. Yeah. And I can use myself, my present experience as a perfect example of that. Oh, yeah. So the last time I was, well, the last time I was here was to lead the Hello Again workshop last November, and I wasn't here for long. The time before that was early September, late August of last year. Yeah. The myth of normal was about to come up. Yeah. Being here was crushingly difficult for me, being in this house. Yeah. Physically, I ended up in the hospital. I'm not saying it was because of you guys at all. There, but there was so much stress going on in my inner world when yeah. I arrived here. You were having a hard time. I was having a hard time. Yeah. I was stressed out about the book and the dynamics in the house were reminiscent to me of things that stressed me out in childhood. Yeah. And my body reacted. Yeah. My body said, hell no. Yeah. And I actually had to leave and move out and move into my uncle and aunt's guest room. And the minute I did, my entire nervous system relaxed. Yeah. But I, actually, I did have some physical, some very severe physical symptoms the night before our book came out. This year, you invited me to come home over the summer and I said no mm -hmm. I said I want to stay in New York this summer it's really important for me to be nesting and building my own yeah. home building my life building the that feels important to me and I'll come in September and I did and when I arrived it felt like I had a protective sheath around me in a good way of a kind of insulation from any stress that might come up in this house which can always happen when you step into your childhood home um but my life feels like a safe place right now mm. and i feel proud of myself and grateful to myself for mm. being true to that impulse of what that would take so of course if i'm not struggling in my life then when i see you i'm not looking at a reminder of how fucked up i currently am <laughs> or how far away from who i want to be i currently am yeah. When I am struggling, it yeah. just is a fact that I'm, I'm sifting through the consequences of my childhood. Now, that's, again, not your fault. But the, depending on where I'm at in that struggle, and Robert Downey Jr. seemed to be a lot more at peace when he made this film. 
Yeah. He was able to probably feel his feelings and probably even some hurt or some sadness. And he had a therapist he was talking to for support, but he didn't yeah. need anything yeah. from his, he might've wanted something from his father. He didn't need it. He didn't need it and he wasn't demanding on it, yeah. demanding and, it. And he actually wanted to celebrate his father. Yeah, that was also very important. Yeah, he wanted to celebrate his father and acknowledge the love that the father always had for him. Yeah. Even through all those years of dysfunction and drug use and so on. Yeah. So that's what's so difficult is is um, is, is is human beings tend to have sort of a unilateral view of things. It's this way or that way, and just how complicated it can be, how great love can coexist with great hurt, and how the end of life. I mean, I don't think it was a coincidence that this happened. First of all, it, it with his father dying, he wanted to make this film. Yeah, but also he had all of a sudden life turned up the chronological heat because we only have so long together. Yeah, now that's not going to happen for everybody. And some of the questions we have today, which we'll get to very shortly after we talk about the next film, are coming from people who, at this point, even in middle age with parents who are getting older, can't imagine reconciling with their parents. Yeah, you know, and and nothing about our book is there's no shoulds in it. We're not saying that um, anyone needs to prove anything or force themselves to do anything in this relationship. But if you're moved to take on questioning the way it is and wondering if it could be otherwise, then we want to help people explore that question. Absolutely. Now the second film we just saw is an example of that. Is an example. Now this yeah. is um, one of the great influences on my understanding of child development and childhood trauma was the Polish Jewish Swiss psychotherapist Alice Miller mm -hmm. whose book um, the drama of the gifted child the German title of this was the prisoners of childhood um, was all about child abuse and its long-term impacts on the psyche and um, it's a seminal book it still is it's a beautifully written book and it it contains so many deep insights and he had, and she wrote other books and she was a fierce advocate for ending child abuse she would write letters to the british prime minister to the pope she would have a public platform widely respected read and revered really internationally we quoted her in the myth of normal and we quoted her in the myth of normal um and what i didn't know until i watched this film is that her son Martin Miller, who himself is a psychotherapist in Switzerland, was severely abused by his father, Alice Miller's husband. Physically. Physically, beaten every day of his life till he was 16 years of age. And Alice Miller not only allowed this to happen, even as she was advocating for children internationally, not only did she allow this to happen, even afterwards, she would not acknowledge it. Worse than that, you know, and, and she actually gaslighted her son in the form of letters yeah. to him in a cold motherly tone, which yeah. get read out by a, an actor in, in the film because Alice died in 2010, I think, saying things like calling really calling her son a failure. Yeah. Uh, right. su subtly, subtly or overtly criticizing him for the ways he has or hasn't healed from his childhood wounds. And at one point saying yeah. Hitler as a result of not healing his childhood, look what he did to the world. And you're like, just like Hitler. And you're basically just like Hitler. No, you know, it's not a quite, we're not condemning Alice Miller here. I mean, no. she, she had her own life, her own influences. Um, she was a um, survivor of the Nazi genocide, um, clearly a traumatized and troubled person. And I imagine it goes back to her own childhood. Um, but the, difficulty for this man who's an adult in his 60s i think by the time this film is made yeah. who who moves so slowly and painfully who's there's something seems broken about him there's also a lovely childish sense of humor about him and presence you know but he really has suffered and he continues to suffer and resent his mother's absolute refusal to acknowledge any of his experience and, and um, occasional cruelty, I would say. Yeah, it's, and, and you know, there's an aunt, 
were a cousin of um, of Alice Miller, who actually acknowledges the the, the, the son's version of the history. Um, but the painful gap between the public persona uh, and 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 uh, fierce moral um, dedicated advocacy for children, and then this person who actually hurt her child so much mm -hmm. and could never even acknowledge it mm -hmm. is it, it's almost well it's it's biblical or shakespearean in its drama absolutely you know, and, and it's, yeah. and it's a, again it's a wonderful film and um, it's called who's afraid of alice miller you yeah. know someone asked that and her son wrote a book called the true drama of the gifted child which is a book i need to read so what am i saying it's a shocking film but my god people it's just so complicated. Yeah, and now, so I found out, I'm the one who told you about both these films. Yeah. I found out about it because yeah. not... He told me about both these films, folks. He gets the credit. All right, that's not, that's, that, <laughs> that was unnecessary. That okay. Was, that was uncalled for. Okay, I take it back. Yeah, and there's a reason I'm saying that. I'm yeah. not looking for credit. I know you're not. I'm thanking the people who brought this film to my attention yeah. because not a few people contact me and say, hey, you know what? I've watched your videos. And I've seen the way you react to your father. And I've seen the way he reacts to you on stage. And I want you to know that I also have a, a parent who's very famous, or at least yeah. has a public profile that does not yeah. match my experience of them. Yeah. And I want to validate for you the special difficulty of that. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you've heard of this, of Martin Miller's case, because you couldn't get a more stark yeah. example. With yeah. us, it's a lot more subtle because you, part of what makes you famous is that you go out there and you admit that you had limitations as a father, you know? And I had limitations as a father. But you said so, not me. I said that I had limitations. Yeah, I think so. I think <laughs> I can find some video evidence of you saying that. <laughs> okay. I think sometimes- A few books maybe. Yeah, I think sometimes mm -hmm. when I'm scrolling through Instagram, all of a sudden a reel comes up of you talking about how you treated me, you know? Yeah. It's it's complicated. Yeah. It's compl And it makes it more subtle for me to stand up for myself or articulate my own version because yeah. you've already gone out there ahead yeah. and gotten out of the head ahead of the thing, as PR people say, you yeah. know? Yeah. So that's a special, not everyone has that. Yeah. But um, but it, no matter how you slice it, however the relationship looks, it's complicated and it couldn't be otherwise. And I've said this many times, I said it last time, the nervous system that's sitting on this side of the couch was conditioned originally by the nervous system sitting on that side of the couch. And so when this nervous system, which is a 48 year old in a couple of weeks, nervous system is sitting around this one, which is an older version of the one that I first encountered. You want to talk about triggers? Well, a stranger on the street can trigger memories of my childhood, but I'm sitting next to you. How much mm -hmm. harder it is, is it for me not to be triggered, not to be triggered, to stay mm -hmm. in the present. And our book is called A Fresh Start for Parents and Their Adult Children. We might have well called it a present moment start, which means many fresh starts over and over again. Yeah. Well, I'll have things to say about that, and we will in the book about how to stay present, because that's really the issue, not just in this relationship, but in all relationships, about how to stay, how to stay present in the moment and not be acting or reacting under the influence of things that happened long ago. Mm -hmm. um, these two films, I have, we, have, we both highly recommend them, I think, not just as entertainment, but as instruction, as just real slices of genuine life. Um, should we take questions? Yeah. Someone's asking, how can it, they're just incredulous about Alice Miller. And I would say, you know, never meet your heroes. <laughs> <laughs> Watch the film or read the book by the sun and make up your own mind. But uh, so we got some, we got some great questions <coughs> here today. And I'm glad to say we've got some time to answer them. So this comes from someone in Pennsylvania. This December will mark the fourth year my daughter, I guess the fourth year since my daughter told me during a phone call that she was cutting me out of her life. Mm. She's, 42 year, she's 42 now. I haven't seen her since, but she has reached out to me via text. And we have talked on the phone and have had friendly conversations. I respected her decision and decided to give her time and space to heal and told her the door is always open. My questions are, how do you know if and when it's a t good time to reconnect? Do you wait for your kid to reach out or what? How do you know if you are ready when you are still feeling the pain, shame, and anger? So I have things I could say, but do you want to take it first? Well, what have you got to say? Well, I'd say, first of all, 
one thing just to acknowledge is your daughter hasn't entirely cut you out of her life. That's right. She had to say that at the time. She needed to hear herself speak those words. And that's how she felt at the moment. That's what it looked like to her in that moment. And I would guess, I'm just speculating here, but the act of being able to say that because I, she, she was never able to say that as a child and she may have wanted to, you know, she may have wanted to get as far away from her parents as she could in certain moments. The act of asserting herself in that way and setting that boundary. Sometimes when we haven't learned how to set boundaries as a kid or when we had to work way too hard to set the boundaries, and I think that was the case for me, we get stuck in sixth gear with them. We can only set the boundary by setting it in a very, very flagrant kind of amplified way. Dram One, dramatic. A dramatic way. So we yeah. can hear ourselves say it. And sometimes it's because I'm not saying this is ca the case for you, the mother who wrote this. But sometimes it's because the person we're setting the boundary with won't listen otherwise. You know, if you if you say no and someone keeps going, then you scream no. And if you scream no and they keep going, you might have to use force. Right. So um, but whatever happened, your daughter said it. And since then, you've had friendly conversations and she's reached out via text. Mm -hmm. So if you're still feeling shame and anger that she said that, it might be interesting just to notice the disconnect between how things actually, you want to talk about a fresh start, you got to look at how it is now, first of all, and appreciate that whatever happened, that wasn't the end. So that's number one. How do you know if and when it's a good time to reconnect? Do you wait for your kid to reach out? How do you know if you are ready when you are still feeling the pain, shame, and anger? Well, I don't think the pain, shame, and anger, I think you just have to deal with the pain, shame, and anger. And you, I, I suspect you may have some suggestions about how to deal with them. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, first of all, <clears throat> I just really want to reinforce what Daniel said. This daughter did not cut you out of her life. She said she needs to take the distance, but in fact, you've had contact since. So rather than being hung up on the words she used on that day, consider that whatever pain or need for separation she may have experienced, she has not shut the door. Although she may not have opened it either to the degree that you would like, but there's still a relationship there. And just allow yourself to feel that, because that's the reality. Allow yourself to feel that, oh yeah, my daughter's still in touch with me. Number one, number two, I wonder <clears throat> if in that space of time you have done any work at all to try to understand where she might have been coming from and what may have impelled her to say that. Because um, not to, this is not to say that you're guilty and she's innocent, it's, but we're not making those judgments. But something happened. And have you considered what may have happened in her life as a child or in your inter in interactions as adults that she may have found hurtful? So have you just considered it? Have you tried it, it, the just the most difficult thing <clears throat> for all of us in any relationship, spousal, friendships, certainly this adult child relationship is to stand the other shoes just for a moment. What's going on for them? That's called attunement. Attunement is our capacity to understand the internal experience of the other. So have you tried to do that? Now, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but if you haven't, I suggest you do. Um, the next point is check in with that pain of yours because I totally understand it. I felt pain in my interactions with my adult kids. I have. But when I look at it more deeply, the pain that I felt in response to my adult kids is not a new pain. It's a pain that's familiar to me. And so some of us carry pain for things that happened long before we had kids. Then that pain is triggered by our kids, but it originally wasn't caused by our kids. Mm -hmm. In that sense, we're responsible for understanding with accepting, investigating, and nurturing our own um, selves in the face of that pain. So I would suggest you do that work. Um, there is a psychological, spiritual teacher called Byron Katie, 
who has written a book called Loving What Is, and she teaches something called The Work. You can look up thework.com, I think. Just, just Google it. You can drop. She does free events. It really gets you to deal with your own stuff in response to somebody else rather than making it about the other person. I highly recommend it. As to when you're ready, um, you're ready whenever you feel like it. And if, if you can reach out to your daughter and say, I, I just wonder if you're ready for more, more conversation and contact now. Because if you are, I sure would be. That would be great, as long as you're not hung up on the answer. Uh -huh. If you reach out to her and you're expecting <clears throat> and attached to a positive response, don't do it because you may not get it. If you can reach out because you're curious and you would like to contact, but you can handle the no, then you're ready. So how you know when you're ready is when you're not attached to the outcome. You may want a certain outcome. Naturally, you do. You want her to say, yes, mom, let's talk. But if you're attached to that outcome, and if you be devastated and, 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 and crushed by a negative response, then you're not ready. If you're ready to be disappointed and say, okay, you're not ready, I get it, the door will stay open, then you're ready. Mm -hmm. So that's how you know, I would say. Right, and that connects to the next question I'll read. Okay. And I would say the same thing to the, the first questioner. How to reconnect with a 19, this is from Serbia. How to reconnect with a 19 year old daughter who has a lack of empathy towards me ever since she became an older sister when she was 12. I have a feeling that I tried everything really. She doesn't react with kindness anymore. Well, so, and again, this goes for both questioners and it goes, I think for many parents. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a wild guess or an assertion. Sorry to interrupt. I'm gonna get myself a glass of water. Would you like some? Yes, I would. Thank okay, you. You keep talking. I'll get the water. Great. Thanks. Um, the 42-year-old daughter who needed to cut her mother out of her life. Well, we cut people out of our lives when being around them gets in the way of our healing gets in the way of us relating to ourselves, being able to grow into the people we want to be. And there was something about that relationship with the mother, I would assert or guess, that was complicating. Like I said to you earlier this year, because you were telling me I'm not responsible for your wounds anymore, Daniel. I, well, I'm not responsible for your wounds. I can't heal your wounds. Yeah. And I said, yes, you cannot heal my wounds and you wouldn't be doing him any favors if you tried, but you do have the capacity to reinfect my wounds like nobody else on the planet. And that just is the way it is, which means I have to be more vigilant and more careful in terms of how I interact with you than I might with other people, right? So now one of the wounds that kids often carry is that their parents needed something from them that was never the child's to give. Yeah. You said... My daughter has lacked empathy for me ever since she was 12 and she became an older sister, okay? The implicit demand on your part, the feeling of need that you have, your deficiency in the sense of needing a 12-year-old to yeah. empathize with you. Yeah. And I'm not saying this to make you wrong or accuse you of anything. I'm just telling you straight up from the point of view of nature, yeah. ain't your daughter's job, never was. And you having any need from her for that was an imposition on her that to her was experienced as a violation. As a pressure. A pressure, and I would say a violation. Yeah. And the ways that parents tend to behave when they, because then they leverage their inherent power, which they have over their kids, to try and extract from their kids what it's never, it's not the kid's responsibility to give. So now you have a 19 year old, now that she's a grown up and has the license to, assert herself, she's going to do that by saying, you know, now there's all kinds of reasons why empathy shuts down. What you're, what you're talking about is your daughter started being cold to you. Your daughter was angry. Maybe your daughter was jealous of the younger sibling, whatever happened. Kids uh, can be affectionate one minute and very cold the next. But if you take it personally, 
to the child, they, can, they really have two choices. They can refuse to play that game, which means move further away from you, or they can override their own need for authenticity and try to coddle you and try to please you. And many kids do. And those are the people that my dad writes about who often end up with chronic illnesses. No, um, are you done with that Not quite. Go ahead. Then. Yeah, you'll know when there's a slight pause after a sentence. There's a pause right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, people always get on me for interrupting him. It's really funny that it actually happens the other way around. Uh, so I would say, you need to look at why do you need your daughter to do that? And as long as you need her to do that, you are not remedying anything. It's an amplification of what she's already carrying. And she is absolutely within her right to keep her distance and, until she can hold her own enough to be around someone with whom that's the history. So that's my answer. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, you go right from Serbia. This, uh, these chickens behind you are from Croatia. Uh, my wife and I bought it on a trip to Croatia. And I'll be in Belgrade in um, three weeks. So maybe I'll see you there. And I was there in December. Yeah, you were. Lovely country. Now, in response to your question, um, yeah, um, you, you, you you have your job your 12 year old's job was never to have empathy for you. Um, something happened for her there. I wonder what was going on in the family. I wonder if all of a sudden she felt deprived of attention because of the new baby. Um, I understand your pain. I mean, I've experienced it myself um, in response to my other kids. I'm not, we're not in any way um, invalidating your emotion here. But if you want to move forward with it, you might want to say to your daughter, if, if you're in conversation, you can say to her, listen, sweetheart, there's something I noticed that, you know, we seem to get along pretty well, at least I thought we did, until you were 12 years old, and then all of a sudden there seemed to be a break. Did you notice that? And is there anything, can we discuss that? I'm not going to blame you for it. I just want to understand what actually happened for you there. In other words, just reach out to try and understand her experience, um, if she's open to that conversation. Uh, but again, um, if you initiate that conversation, really be ready to hear the answer and not defend yourself, but just to understand the other person's position. In other words, if you want to invite empathy for yourself, have empathy for her mm -hmm. and her experience. Mm -hmm. And um, it, along with the pain that you have and the disappointment that you have, there's a longing for a deeper relationship, which is why you have pain. And so, if you want that deeper relationship, you need to approach her with empathy and a real interest in her experience. And go get that empathy somewhere else. Yeah. You do need it. Yeah. Go find it where it is. Where it's available. Where it's available and where it's fitting to look from it. Friends, a spouse, a lover, a therapist, nature, you know, anywhere but your daughter who's trying to learn to have empathy for herself the best way she can. And she's trying to be an individual. And she's 19. <clears throat> yeah. But even if she was 42, even if she was 62, you know, people work on their stuff as long as they work on it. And if they're still struggling, you don't have to choose to be around them. It can, if it's too painful for you, parent can always choose, you know, I can't have you in my life. But what you can't do is expect them to give you something that was never theirs to give. Yeah. So anyway, I hope to see you in Belgrade in, uh, in a few weeks. Yeah. Very interesting question here. Yeah. Uh, and I, I like this question because it's more systemic. It's more about, it's a bigger picture. Okay. Many adult children of boomer parents are recognizing the unhealthy systems and patterns we inherited through generational trauma. We went through a defiant, cathartic phase where it was a meme to mock and blame boomers for all the wrongs in modern society. I don't know if ever, anyone remembers this hashtag, OK Boomer, that was very popular a few years ago, mm. which is basically a way of just taking the piss out of an entire generation of people. And it was very, very, um, it caught on very quickly. Mm. Millennials especially, but also people in my generation. 
um, which is somewhere between millennial and Gen X. Um, at this point, it feels like kicking down because the millennials are healing and ready to contribute to rebuilding, while many of our living boomer parents are in their later decades of life and still hurting. Peace is deserved and available at any age, and as adults, there is, a, there is a desire to care for our elders, a natural, cyclical impulse that our anti-compassionate culture discourages. How can we honor our parents and help them into their own conscious healing when they have spent a lifetime on guard and in toxic self-sufficiency? And in some cases, in toxic narcissistic tendencies. I can't tell you how many millennial people come to me in my mental chiropractic practice and tell me that they're, they just realized that their parents were narcissists. And I would guess that this is a more prevalent thing than it ever has been before for all kinds of historical reasons. Well, it's a very complex question. Let me give a stab at an answer. <clears throat> First of all, narcissism. Um, nobody's born a narcissist. In fact, I should say everybody's born a narcissist but nobody's born programmed to stay a narcissist. So narcissism is a certain phase of development where kids think that it's all about them. A healthy phase. It's a healthy phase. The baby thinks it's all about him. I mean, look, a baby doesn't have to say a word, and when they're hungry, food appears in the form of a bottle or a, or, or a female breast. Um, if the baby's tired, they're put to sleep. If the baby's uncomfortable, wet, they're changed. They don't have to say anything. They also have no concept of any consciousness outside their own. No. There are no others. No, there's no sense of others. So they're pure narcissists. And it's a developmental phase. When the conditions are right for healthy development, people grow out of it. So if you're going to talk about a generation tinged by narcissism, you first of all have to ask, well, what happened to that generation? And that boomer generation, I was just a little bit ahead of them by a couple of years. Your mother... Daniel was, I suppose, what you might call a boomer, born in 1948. Um, they um, economically <clears throat> were given um, goods that no generation got before. Yeah, the post-war post surplus, the boom. The post-war capitalist boom that... We're not going to the politics or the economics. In of fact, it. in fact, they were a con they were one of the things that boomed. It's a baby boom, right? There yeah. was a yeah. this all of a sudden explosion of yeah, reproduction and the ability to care for them. But those children received a lot of material goods that other generations had not, and they certainly had the sense that they were going to be materially better off than their parents ever were, which was true for that generation. It's no longer true for younger generations. It was true then, temporarily. But at the same time, <clears throat> the parents were um, taught parenting practices that were toxic in many ways. The um, sort of the demigod of parenting was Dr. Spock, who taught parents not to pick up the kids at night when they were crying. In fact, he talked about the tyranny of the infant who wanted to be picked up. And parents were busy working, making a living. And the emphasis was on materialism, not on emotional or spiritual values. So those boomer kids really lost out in a lot of ways, so they stayed narcissists, especially in the culture that um, encourages acquisition, selfishness, greediness, individualistic competition. It's all about me. Well, and then if I just, just to add on to that, it encourages that. And then some of the boomers reacted against that with the sexual revolution of the 60s the hippie generation which is all about me drugs, well. which is also all about me yeah. it's spiritual hedonism yeah. now i'm going to go have experiences and even you know healing and 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 self-exploration personal developments about me yeah. can turn into that yeah if, so, it, if it doesn't mature so to go back to the question so first of all if you're able to have some empathy for their experience despite whatever hurt you may have experienced from them, um, <clears throat> that would help if you want to help. If you can't have empathy, you can't help. But in your question, there's certainly a sense of empathy. So just round that out with a bit of understanding of where that generation was coming from. Um, <clears throat> many of their parents actually were probably quite traumatized by their war experience as well. Oh, sure. Which would have affected the boomers' generation's development. Having said that, um, in the last 
I've always, um, for decades, I've had an interest in uh, Buddhist psychology and, 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 and self-awareness practices, but I've never practiced them much. No, more recently I have. And um, more recently I've become aware of the importance of self-awareness, not of selfish awareness, but of awareness of what's happening inside me. So I would say... Which is really just awareness. <laughs> it's awareness. Yeah. All you have is what's happening inside you, really. Yeah, and ultimately it is, <laughs> you know. Um, well, that's a philosophical discussion. Let's not, know. Let's not know. go there. Yeah. Uh, I would say to you, if you want to help anybody else, including your parents, become aware of your own reactions, of your own emotions, of your own desires, of your own agendas. Um, and once you attune to your own internal experience, you'll be able to attune much better to the internal experience of somebody else. But until you attune to their internal experience, you can't help them. So I would say work on attunement first with yourself and then with whoever you're trying to engage with. So that would be um, my answer, to make a long story short. Just understand by what the forces that may have shaped their existence and what got them, what got them to the point they're at right now. Number one, number two, attune, if you want to. And recognize that there's always going to, I'd say two things. Number one, recognize there's always going to be an experience gap. You can't know what they're going through. You can try to sense it. But one of the best things you can do is ask questions. And also your, 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 your aging parents are approaching the end of their lives probably quicker than you are. Um, so they're having an experience that you've never had of facing their own mortality and you know advanced aging and things like that. These are things we can be open to and curious about. That's what I was very touched by with Robert Downey Jr. and his father. Asking him, Dad, what do you see? What What do you when, in your clear moments? What do you see? You know. And is there anything you want your son to know? Is there anything you want your son to know? Asking, really wondering, like inquiring into yourself, what do I want to know about their experience? And then asking it. And then again, just like you said about parents to their children, be open to the answer. Which actually, this is not to pull a fast one on you, but the question comes up for me. So, uh, if, if I may ask it. Mm -hmm. um, so as you know, in um, in a few months, I'll be 80 years old. And um, um, my parents died when they were 82. Yeah, that's right. Um, and both of them seemed much older than you do now. Yeah. Your maternal grandparents... Lived into their 90s. Lived into their 90s. Or you, close, yeah. Yeah. Well, your, your, your grandfather... Uh, was 88 when 91 was my grandfather. 91 and 92? Yeah. Okay, now let's assume I live as long as your long, longest lived grandparent. Yeah. Then I have 11 years left. Uh -huh. Okay, and who the hell knows if I have 11 days left? I'm just never know this. Never. Do you, as my son, this is not this is totally open to the question, mm -hmm. ever think about my death? I do. And uh, the fact that it's numerically, there's not that many years left. And does that thought in any way influence you? your current interactions with me um not that it should i'm only asking how yeah how might how you might relate to that question well look uh, no uh, let's let's be honest let's be honest on a certain well, level it should in a perfect world it would would it i would like of course yeah in a sane situation in, in a in a situation where look in a sane culture we'd have a different relationship to death period We'd be always aware of the, the the fleetingness of life. We live in a death phobic culture, all kinds of stuff. And yes, in a in in a, I would want for myself to be related to. I mean, someone said in the comments, Daniel, check yourself, get your shit right. My mother died at ninety two, and nothing is more important than that. You know. By the by the way, tomorrow well, night. Tomorrow night. I'm, I'm in the middle of an answer. I, I know, but let me just jump in. Okay. Because you you said something about death phobic, yeah. and tomorrow night we're going to see this wonderful Canadian Stephen Jenkinson, yeah. who who's talked a lot about um, dying wise, and in a book called Die Wise, and a book called um, Come of Age. He's very concerned with 
engaged with the idea of death in our culture and and engaged with the idea of why we're so off the mark in terms of how yeah. healthy cultures deal with that um and i would say that it's a in my gentler moments i can i can i can hold that reality you know and actually on this trip i feel more gently towards you and mom and so last night we sat at the dinner table and we had a conversation where I really just sat and listened to mom yeah. unspool some things about her life and yeah. some reflections and in a way that last year I would not have had the patience for. Mm. And it wouldn't have been good for me to try at that moment. I would have been straining too hard. Yeah. So it's not a it's not a panacea of a thought like, oh shit, my dad's going to die. Now all of a sudden I can just put all my stuff to the side. I'm working through my stuff in good faith as quickly as I can. And yeah, remembering, dropping that seed of mortality into the mix mm. helps me keep the the fire of that burning because I don't have all the time in the world. But at the mm. same time, I can't bypass whatever I'm dealing with unless it gets to the point where I'm like, okay, I'm just going to put that stuff to the side. I'm just going to be with you until it's over and then I'll deal with it. Okay, so... Look again. I'm not. I just think it's interesting. No, I know you're not. You you asked an interesting question, and yeah. I think I gave you an interesting answer. And I'm. It's a complex answer. And I'm gonna come back with another question if I may. Yeah. Um, I never thought this was gonna go here, but here we are. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, if I ask you to drop into that idea right now, at this very second, I'm not gonna do it in front of the in front of the whole world like this. Okay, then that's that's, fine. that's that's too. Uh, that's out of bounds. Yeah, because you know what, it's it's just too personal and it's too it's too complex. I can't I can't do it with um, with people watching. Okay. That's not my job to do that with people watching. Well, there's no expectation that you would. Yeah, fair enough. Is there another question? Well, but I will say this. <clears throat> no, I, I will say this. Yeah, if I drop into it, just a little bit. Just okay. dip a toe in, which is about as far as I feel safe doing in this moment. Okay. And partly, actually, that growth for me is learning what do I feel safe doing in a moment? What do I not feel safe doing? Yeah. How much of a boundary do I need? Yeah. Boundaries are best when they're flexible, like an immigration policy that can change. The, the border can get looser or tighter depending on what's going on inside the country, you know? Fair enough. And it's contextual. But as I, if I drop into it, I just drop into like, wow, I'm pretty glad we're doing this right now. Mm. while we're both here this is a pretty yeah. cool thing to be doing with yeah. this part of our lives yeah yeah that's great you know um anything other than that feels like trying to make something happen forcing something forcing something which yeah. is exactly what and that and of course trying to force something triggers the parts of my nervous system that brace that tighten up and yeah. that don't want to be around <clears throat> you yeah and i can't i can't hack that system yeah. i have to work with it learn about it i mean this this is healing 101 yeah right yeah fair mm -hmm. enough um yeah you can't force healing as someone said and there's no should about healing the minute you put should into healing it's not healing anymore or as the supremes saying you can't hurry a lot you just have to wait that's right uh <laughs> that's right um da, 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 da. All right, here's an interesting one. Is there any purpose or benefit to... Conf this is kind of a long one, but... Is there any purpose... And we can make this the last one if you want. It, it, let's do that. Yeah. I can read your body language. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. After an hour or so, I, I started... I know. Feeling but like I, I'm glad we took a little bit extra time today. No, that's just fine. Just to stretch. I think part of the... La when we did it last time, I was feeling compressed for time. Okay. So we want to split the difference between my discomfort and your discomfort. Let's do that. <laughs> In fact, that's a good that's a good rule for everybody. Find find out what makes each other uncomfortable and split the difference because you're both going to be a little uncomfortable. Is there any purpose or benefit to confronting unresolved issues with a parent when my mom herself has not healed from her own trauma, resulting in a lot of dysfunction in her own life? And then there's you know there's a divorce going on between the her parents now, and she's just she's you know she has a horribly offensive and very skewed, twisted views of my dad. I don't seem to be able to ignore this and continue the same previously fairly good relationship I had with my mom because my relationship with my dad is the best. But my mom has struggled with addiction, chronic illness, almost died many times, and all I know it's connected to her awful childhood trauma and multiple kinds of abuse from her own mother and brother at a very young age. 
I think this has influenced her ability to receive unconditional love from a spouse, which my dad has always shown her. Yet her perception of things is extremely off, so she doesn't see things this way. She calls him an abuser and more. Anyways, I don't think that any productive conversation of resolution and healing can occur between her and I about this because simply her perspective, her reality, is not factual. Yet she wants to come stay at my house. We are in different states, and I would say that you are in different states in more ways than one. Yeah. And act like everything is normal and good, and I can't. It would be fake on my part to do so. Okay, let me just quickly mentally chiropractice a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Her coming to stay at your house has nothing to do with any of that other stuff. The question for you is, do you want to be around her right now as she is? Now, you seem very sure that her version of events is not factual, which she is, says to me that your version of events is factual. That strikes me as a pretty shaky place from which to start in dealing with anything difficult in life, actually. Just being right and assuming that your version of things is the whole complete and total truth and nothing but the truth, and that someone else's version is completely and totally invalid. And there are all kinds of reasons, I think, to at least question the notion that one person who remembers a relationship as ideal and wonderful is right. And the other person who remembers it as quote unquote abusive or painful or difficult is a hundred percent wrong. That strikes me as just based on what I know of relationships and people, you might want to question that. But what I'm hearing is that you find your mother's version of events very painful. It's hard for you to be around her version of events right now. Well, that's your difficulty. And you get to own that. But to make it about her version of reality is not real, it's not factual, so on and so forth, that your relationship with your dad is the best and your relationship with her was good until this and now she wants to divorce him and all this kind of stuff. Um, there is certainly some favoritism going on. You prefer one version of events to the other and the fact that they're at odds, you can't resolve that contradiction. It's up to you if you want your mother to stay with you. And it may be completely, you know, you started the question by saying, um, is there any value or purpose or benefit to confronting unresolved issues with a parent when she has not healed from her own trauma? Well, there may not be any purpose or benefit in discussing it with her. But you're going to have to, you can confront it without discussing. But that, look, as long as you think she's completely wrong and you think you're completely right, no, there's probably no benefit in talking about it with her. Absolutely. And that would be true in any relationship. That's what kind of conversation is that? No. And, and that would be true in a political conversation. If I'm sure that you are completely wrong and your point of view is completely invalid and mine is completely right and I know everything, why would we even talk about it? But in a personal relationship, so much more. Now, I would say, first of all, um, <clears throat> let's acknowledge your pain here. This mm -hmm. is troubling to you. Yeah. Uh, you're asking the question because you are troubled by it. Um, uh, you want something genuine, you, you, you like a, a real relationship with your mom, and right now you don't see a way to having it. So let's acknowledge that, okay? Um, at the same time, I would tell you, you have no idea about your parents' actual relationship. You think your mother was traumatized and your father was not. That ain't the way it is. I'm telling you, 100% of the time, people marry people exactly at the same level of trauma that they're at. That's just how it works. It's like water seeking its own level. So if your mother was traumatized, so was your dad. <clears throat> the way he copes with it may be totally different. Um, but I can tell you in a relationship <clears throat> between two people, when one of them is acting it out, almost for sure there's something going on between the two of them that you don't see, then you have no insight into, then you have no idea of their history before you were born. And furthermore, the fact that <clears throat> you feel closer to your dad now, um, and I'm glad you feel close to your dad, but it means that you're just not the best judge to know what's really happening between them. So I would just echo what Dan was saying. <clears throat> if you're not ready to be around your mother, then don't be. If her version of history is so troubling to you that you can't abide it, um, you're under no obligation to do so. But if you want to be wise about it, 
be aware that you don't really know what happened between those two people. You don't really know uh, what their internal experience is. Um, and um, from that point of view, you may want to be curious or you may not want to be curious, but whichever you are, I would echo my son's uh, advice that drop this idea that you think you really know what's going on because I believe you do not actually. Yeah, um, so the honest thing to say to your mom, if you're not going to have her stay, would not be, mom, until you get your mind right, I can't be around you because you're out of touch. The honest thing to say is, mom, this divorce is a shock to me. It's a shock to my system. I don't know what to do with it. I'm confused. I'm upset. And I don't know what to make of the fact that you guys have such different recollections. And I, in your recollection, it is so different from mine. I find that so disturbing to my peace and equilibrium that right now I need to not be in a situation where that could even come up. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I don't have the capacity to host you right now. Yeah, that's that would be an honest thing to say. Okay. Um, I think that brings us to a close. Um, we thank you for your <clears throat> attention to us and certainly for your questions, um, which continue to challenge us and to give us more material to work with. Mm -hmm. um, any final comments about how to follow this stuff and what we would like from these people, if anything? Yeah, well, um, so at least one of the questioners um, uh, wrote in their email to us that they'd be willing to be interviewed for our book. And we are compiling a list of people who'd be willing to, you know, so if you think that your particular story, your situation would be interesting to others and ha and shed some light on this or, yeah, I'd say that that would be the question. Like, do you do you want this to be in a book about this topic? But, but no, not necessarily with your name identified. Right. And... Now, we can't promise to <clears throat> take a lot of time to counsel you or coach you on it. So that's not what you're signing up for. It, it, we could ask questions that would be, but we're talking about sharing your stories so yeah. we can learn about what families yeah. other than ours are going yeah. through because our situation is in some ways universal and in some ways very specific. You can email us at uh, helloagainbook at gmail.com. Um, there's a website, helloagainproject.com, but it's I haven't touched it in a while. It's a little out of date. I'm not sure what the... Should we get it activated? Well, we've got, we've got a, I think we've got a mailing list uh, that's... Mm -hmm being created so yeah at some point we'll tell you when that app website is relevant again in, in december subscribe uh, to this youtube channel that's what you can do yeah please yeah. hit subscribe in december below the video in december we're doing a live event um in topanga california mm -hmm. at a place called the commune you can check out the commune website it's going to be a very limited number of people who can i think the applications are already in but the good news is it's being filmed and it's going to become oh okay it's going to become an online course that you so you can basically experience the yeah what the workshop is like remotely yeah anyway and we're going to keep doing this as as schedules allow you're you're traveling for the next few months yep um i'll be gone to the uk uh, london scotland and then um through the former yugoslavia prague transylvania hungary um for the next um, month and a half or so they really like you in hungary for some reason mm. Maybe because I speak the language perfectly well. <laughs> <laughs> so when are you back? I'm back at the end of October. Okay, so maybe in November yeah. we'll we'll reconvene and do this. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, it was a nice conversation today. Thank you. Yeah, and we, by speaking out loud to all of you out there, I think we have original, we have thoughts we haven't had before, and that's exactly what needs to be happening right yeah. now. So thank you. Thanks. Be well, everyone. Bye-bye.